Hi, I'm Michael. Glad you could come tonight or whenever you are viewing this particular presentation. I'm going to be discussing um, the future of libraries and how information technology will impact that future. You've probably read the blurb on it, so I'm going to go into detail. There are four areas that I want to focus on this evening, or in my case it's this evening. Um, I'm going to be talking about our patrons, both from the academic side and also from the public librarian side. What are their changes? How do adults use the internet? How do teenagers use the internet? How do they use technology in general? How might that affect our libraries? I'm also going to be talking about searching. Uh, pretty much everyone can assume today that Google is the one place that folks start, regardless of age, in searching. Why not the library? Why not the OPAC? We'll be discussing some of that tonight. We'll be talking a lot about ebooks. This seems to be sort of the last bastion of the library, and as we'll talk later, um, OCLC and its reports show that most patrons these days, particularly in public libraries, still link the book with the library. What will happen if the print book goes away? And I'll also be talking about content in general, particularly in academic library settings. We have this concept that everything is free on the internet, but that's not true, and we'll work on that. I do want to start off with this concept in a few, few little spotlights here, in quotations. The uh, New York Times came out with an interesting article on 21st of October. Ebook fans keep format in the spotlight. They started off by noticing that the publishing industry is under a dark cloud. Sales are down, expectations are down, people are reading less, they're going on the internet, watching movies, etc., more often than reading. However, they do note that with the rise of the Kindle, with the rise of Sony's new ebook reader, we find that people are reading more, at least in this new electronic era. So to start us off, I want to talk about one particular quote. Um, they interviewed a loan officer in Newland, in, uh, which is in North Carolina. This person owns a computer, a Blackberry, an iPod Touch. She calls herself a gadget person. She says that paper books just feel strange to her, even though she is an avid reader as a child. This is the part that we see more and more often. People are used to print, but really are focusing more on their gadgets these days. How will that impact the library? That said, let's begin with our users in a little bit more detail. Knowing our public, knowing the students, knowing faculty, depending on the type of library, how are they using the internet? Um, an interesting statistic that we have these days is that nearly 80% of all adults have used the internet in the past year, in one form or another. Um, that doesn't seem as much as most people would expect. I think my own self, when I looked at these statistics, I would have figured 90% or higher in that particular process. Um, but it's roughly just under 80%. Um, many of those people use social networking sites, um, which have become even more popular, interestingly enough, with older people. Um, we can see, for instance, that 20% of adults use Twitter, which of course has been in the news heavily this past year. 73% um, of those that are using the internet use Facebook. 48% uh, are using MySpace. S much smaller number use things like LinkedIn, which is about 14%. And then other social sites, you know, social networking sites, we see 10, 8, those types of percentages. But still, there's a lot of use here. If we look at the medium age of users, it's quite interesting as well. Um, MySpace is the lowest medium age. It's 26 in terms of the age. Um, Facebook is 33. Twitter is 31. LinkedIn is 39. More women than men are using these particular social networking sites. 21% are female. About 17% are male. Um, so there's a lot of that going on right now in terms of the way people are using the internet and particularly social networking sites. If we looked at where they go in terms of actually beginning a search or using the internet, we see that 89% go to search engines. The vast majority of those are Google. Only 2% go to the website of a library to actually begin any of their searching. So that's another interesting fact just to set the tone here at the, at the beginning. Um, all that said, if we start looking at some more details, people say that teenagers are born digital these days and that they are the ones leading this new wave of technology. I do want to throw a caveat in here, or at least a, a point of thought. Um, 
While research shows that teenagers are using the internet heavily, as well as cell phones and, you know, um, iTouch and similar iPhone interactive devices um, that integrate web as well as uh, digital uh, cellular services, we're actually seeing that they're not very literate in terms of using these devices. Yep, they know and how to get through the applications, but they don't quite understand how they work. They don't quite understand how they fully integrate and how to get the best out of each of these particular devices. Um, what's interesting, teens are using the internet in a variety of different ways. Um, cell phone use, text messaging, uh, emailing, etc. These have all changed a little bit, but not too much in the past few years. Um, for instance, 38% of teenagers in 2008 actually text message. I personally would have thought that to be higher. 36% um, use cell phones on a daily basis. 32% um, still use landlines on a daily basis in terms of talking to people. Um, spending time with friends on a personal daily basis out of school is about 29%. Um, instant messaging is about 24%. Uh, and yet regular email is only 18%. Um, which show, and that's been decreasing over the past few years. So while we understand that teenagers use technology a lot, they're not necessarily using it all the time. And when it comes to text messaging, which is the largest use of technology or the largest means of communication, it's not necessarily from phones that they're text messaging either. Many times they're simply text messaging via the social networking sites like Facebook to their friends in this particular uh, context. Given that, um, some people think that with teenagers moving the way they are, they're going to sort of bypass the library. They're going to seek out free information on the Internet. They're going to try and find ways of getting whatever they can but not going through the library. And yet we see a variety of new programs coming out to actually support teenagers in locating information on the Internet. Um, we see many librarians starting Twittering, starting Facebook groups, having book discussion groups, having help support groups, um, starting manga, anime, and other types of uh, interest groups on things like MySpace and on Facebook, etc. Working with teenagers and at the same time providing information literacy throughout this process. Um, the fact is that they're very interested in all information not necessarily the book. And that, I think, is where the library is beginning to excel and meeting the needs of their users. So we're providing them with video. We're providing them with audio. We're providing them with, you know, um, manga. We're providing them with anime. We're providing them with graphic novels. We're giving them spaces to meet. We're giving them opportunities to either virtually or physically discuss their interests. Uh, many public libraries these days have dedicated uh, YA librarians, let alone YA space in this process. So we see this integration of the old with the new in this particular process. Um, in a similar way, we find that um, older adults are also, who are also using a lot of these new technologies, still find, particularly in the public library sector, um, a, a strong use for integrated multimedia uh, content. So we do see adults who are Twittering, who are using Facebook, et cetera, reading the libraries, possibly reading e-books, but also going and looking for print books. Circulation statistics are still fairly strong in public library sectors, particularly for bestsellers and other materials that have just been released. We also find that the use of DVDs is still on the increase. While audio material has decreased, unless a library has negotiated a particular uh, package for the downloading of e-music, we do see that there's still interest in other types of media, which, if you, uh, gaming, as well as some of the new media like manga and anime, which does appeal to older people as well as the younger people. So we see changes in our teenagers, and we see teenagers in our young adults. We see changes in our adult population, but still there's a strong draw to some of the traditional materials as well. Talking about faculty, undergraduate students and the university and college environments, there have been some dramatic changes in the way they use content, the way they use internet technologies, the way they access the library. In the sciences, fully 90 percent of the material read by faculty and other researchers 
After that, book of chapters is about 47%. Websites are about 34%. Conference proceedings are about 24%. And then personal contact is about 23%. There are magazines and a few other things, but they're a small percentage. Of the largest percentage, uh, which I said was journal articles, almost all faculty members want them these days in electronic format. So in university libraries, we see a large increase in, obviously, e-journals and e-journal packages. Um, we also see growth in e-books, and I'm going to touch on that in a little bit. I'm going to touch on that a little bit later in more detail. Um, and the development of specific websites just for a particular area of research, et cetera, in that process. So where do faculty, where do researchers, and where do students go to get the content they need for their education and for their research? Students start with Google. Research points to that right now. And after Google, the second most used site is Wikipedia. However, research that has examined how students use Google and Wikipedia indicates that they only use it to get background information, to start off the process, whether they're working on a term paper, whether they're working on a problem set, whether they're trying to come up with the citations for their literary report, etc. After that, then they start using the more specialized services. Indexes and abstracts to some extent, but more often just delving right into the full text e-journal packages. Um, in some fields, we have seen, for instance, a drop in the use of indexes and abstracts as a jumping in point. Um, I can tell you, for instance, that InSpec, Biosis, um, and similar indexes and abstracts in the sciences have dropped in many different libraries across the United States over the past few years, and yet increases in large journal package usage, Science Direct, for instance, or the Springer packages have seen increases in use. So students are starting off with Google, they're starting off with Wikipedia, getting their background information, getting the few links that they need, and then jumping off from that into the more in-depth, focused uh, resources that we are providing through the libraries. In fact, a lot of research, depending on the field, has indicated that students will only use material if it is available in electronic form. Um, undergraduates go into libraries to look at print journals, shows a sharp decrease. If it isn't online, they pretty much won't use it, um, except for books. We do see that students will go ahead to libraries and look up books, um, but still that's also dropping in terms of usage. If we look at the faculty member, if we look at the researcher, some of them will start with Google, some of them will start with Wikipedia. More often they're going into the journal packages and the indexes and abstracts. There's been an increased use in indexes and abstracts, specifically abstracts that link to full text, that allow you to search citations and jump from one to another to another. Obviously, packages like Science Citation Index are very popular in the sciences, but there's similar packages available for the social sciences and humanities. Researchers want to be able to integrate and to link and then to use things like RefWorks to manage all this content online. This is a strong area where libraries have taken the lead. We're able to pull together, many times through federated searching, the ability to bring together all of these materials. And one of the key factors that makes libraries still strong is the fact that much of the material on the internet is not for free. You have to pay for it, the toll access concept of much of our e-journal subscriptions, for instance. So here, libraries working with publishers, working with aggregators and other distributors, help to develop tools that will make the, well, that will make the life and the research and the searching of researchers, scientists, faculty, and students much easier. Federated searching, while it has not been overly successful, is a step in the right direction. Aggregation of resources is a key aspect. We see, of course, many third-party vendors bringing in information like EBSCO and Academic Search Premier, for instance, is one of these products. Um, we see libraries developing their own integrated service collections or integrated resource collections and putting them all together with a single interface, which makes it much easier for 
a given researcher, faculty member, even student to access this material. And I think that's where the strength of the library um, will be in the future. We'll see the ability to integrate all of these electronic resources regardless of what format they are. This is also touching on one of the weaknesses that we have in our OPACs. Um, as I mentioned earlier, researchers, even students and the general public, tend to go right away to search engines. They're not going to a library website. They're not going to our online public access catalogs. And one of the reasons for that is, a sh well, research has shown that users are frustrated with the OPAC, not necessarily because of its search features, although many OPACs have taken on a Google-esque look using keywords and other help features, but it's more in the fact that the OPAC itself has been so focused on monographs that it sort of disregards all the other formats of information. Um, almost everyone these days, and I say this not in generality but based on research, sees information regardless of format. If it's a video, if it's a podcast, if it's a conference proceedings, maybe a blogging of a conference proceedings, as well as peer-reviewed research, um, scholarly articles, uh, review articles, um, academic books, etc., all integrated together. Regardless of format, they want to be able to search all of that. Then, once they get the results, the individual can make a determination whether or not this particular piece of information or that particular piece of information will be useful for them. <clears throat> that, I think, is one of the weaknesses right now of libraries, but we recognize it and we're moving forward and there are a number of initiatives to integrate a lot of this material. Some very innovative OPACs are being designed right now and being implemented which take advantage of this. Another aspect of searching where libraries can make a strong impact is to take research on visualization. We've seen changes, for instance, in Google over the past few years in visualization as well as other searching or other search engines. Uh, a good example of this was if you think back not even that long ago, about four or five years ago, when you got a result back from any particular search engine, you frequently just had the URL, the link, and it would take you off. Since then, they've added all sorts of content. There'll be snippets. There'll be highlighting of your keywords in bold or italic. There'll be what we call the clouds showing up with the tagging words bigger than others and showing you related terms in this particular process. So there's a lot more visualization, a lot more of context in terms of the results coming back for you. And there's even feedback mechanisms that are being developed that when a, when a result comes back to the individual, he or she can interact with that and then modify that result to get an even better return in terms of what they're looking for to meet their particular information need. This is an area that libraries and information scientists have been excelling in. This is an area where we can bring that expertise in developing our OPACs and working with vendors, working with even open source people to develop the next generation of search engines from the library's perspective that will reach not just the free material, which is of course what Google and other search engines provide, but also with the deep material, the dark sort of archive type material that's only available through the subscription services, through the contracts, through the e-resources that we provide in libraries. This is going to be one of the strongest and most potentially useful aspects for our users based on research that we currently have. They want material electronically, they want it in a single interface, and they want to be able to take it and organize it regardless of format. Another aspect of searching has to do with the fact that users want to feel self-empowered. Almost all statistics show a drop in reference. Um, this could be all types of reference, from simple coming up asking where is such a thing to more in-depth searching. We see this in academia, but we also see it in public libraries. With the availability of simple search engines like Google, uh, organization site, I should say, resource sites like Wikipedia, people find that they can meet most of their needs pretty quickly. Um, one research uh, paper showed that um, while people, that's the word I want to use here, while they knew 
that what they were receiving through a search engine was not necessarily all that was available or what could be the best type of information, 93% were satisfied with this aspect. That whatever they were getting was good enough for what they needed. Um, and that actually dropped to 84% satisfaction if librarians were involved in this process. So that means that if they go out on their own, they feel self-empowered, they can get to the information, at least enough information to satisfy whatever their query is. If they have help from a librarian, this tends to actually decrease that satisfaction level. Um, it's sort of, I think someone said, it's like eating spinach. We, we tell them, well, this is the way you should be doing it. It's the best way for you. So like eating spinach is good for you. Um, in this particular case, uh, people react to that differently. Uh, no, I don't like my spinach. No, I don't like you telling me that this is the way it should be. And yet we have so much going on with information literacy. So this sort of tug and pull here that we should be training them and at the same time they don't want to be trained. Um, and I think that is resulting in a variety of different hmm, challenges for the library system. But if we design the sites themselves and do the integration well, we should be able to meet most of their needs and still provide backup, i.e. reference services and similar services for those smaller percentages that do ask for that particular type of service. Um, I want to spend a lot of time on ebooks tonight. In the 19, let's see, it was a 2007 uh, report from OCLC that said nearly 80% of all users that were surveyed, the first thing they thought of when they thought of a library was a book. The concept of library and book seems to be inseparable. I'm not saying that the library is going to disappear or die. What I am saying is that ebooks is going to have a stronger impact in the near future than many people anticipate. And I base this on a variety of pieces of information and a lot of trends that are going on. I mentioned at the beginning this quote from the New York Times article that came out on the 21st of October and how ebooks are beginning to influence the way people are, be are changing their reading habits. Ten years ago, ebooks was a possibility and it didn't work. Five years ago, ebooks also had a strong possibility and it didn't work. Today, things are changing, and these are the reasons why. Primarily, it has to do with ebook readers. We all know that reading a computer screen is very difficult. The idea of a backlit system is a strain on the eye. It can be physically measured. However, with the new reflective technology that we see in the Kindles and within the Sony readers, and even with Barnes and Noble's new reader, we have the ability to actually look at something as if it were a particular piece of paper, as if it were an article, as if it were a book. It doesn't strain the eye. You can actually use these ebook readers and change the font size, which is one of the strengths that we have that we, on an ebook reader that we don't have on a particular um, printed piece of paper itself. So the technology itself is improving. At the same time, hype is increasing. Um, statistics show, showed that, of course, when Oprah mentioned that she was reading and using the Kindle, suddenly everyone was out buying Kindles. Um, that Oprah effect actually ripples across anything that she mentions regarding books. But simply having the publicity brings forward this new technology. In a similar fashion, it was with CDs in the early 80s. People were wondering, what are these little silver discs? Wasn't it great that we had cassettes? Wasn't it great that we still had LPs? And yet, it still took about a year or two for them to be accepted and to actually become more, it took more than that for them to become the dominant sort of format for audio. And of course, those have been, uh, that has been surpassed by the new current technology. But ebooks themselves, um, we see a trend in publishers, particularly in the scientific area, but in many other types of publishing, a creation of ebook packages. More and more material is being produced for ebooks. Um, we see direct ebook, for instance, in a number of publishers. So we, we almost at a tipping point here where the publishing industry has sort of jumped on. We have very good technology, not necessarily perfect technology for ebook readers. And we're seeing an acceptance by the general public and an increase sort of publicity by the media. By the way, as a side example, this media um, aspect is very important, and I'm talking about the um, publicity aspect. 
in addition to the Oprah effect, things like Twitter, which have been showing up more and more, every time it's mentioned, more and more and more people get interested in that. The same thing happens with ebooks. Um, Dan Brown's new book, which just came out, um, had more ebook copies sold than printed copies sold. Um, and that's still the case right now. So people are downloading these, they're beginning to use them, they're using them in different ways as well. According to Amazon, people who use Kindles now buy 3.1 times as many books as they did before owning a device. That factor is up from 2.7 in December 2008. So according to the New York Times article, Readers who had previously bought eight books from Amazon would now be purchasing, on average, 24.8 books, which is a rise from 21.6 books. Um, a caveat to this, of course, is that the e-books are much cheaper right now simply because Amazon and other publishers are discounting them. Um, $9.99, $8.99, similar types of prices, whereas you'd be paying much more if you were buying a print version of the particular book. However, the subsidies will help uh, get people into the mode of using electronic books. In academia, e-books have been around for a while. Research indicates that graduate students, undergraduate students, postdocs, faculty members, etc., particularly want books for reference ideas or for reference uses, i.e., they want to look up something small, they're interested in just a chapter, they're interested in just a piece of information. It's basically the way we used to go and look up an encyclopedia, look up a bibliography, etc. We would pull the information out, just a small snippet, and go with it from there. If the book is nonfiction, this tends to be the primary habit of using information, uh, particularly ebooks. With the public library aspect, we're seeing more and more people interested in fiction. And this was one area that, say, five years ago, people were uh, predicting that, well, yeah, I'd still want to cuddle with my book on the beach. You know, I don't have to worry about it if it falls in the sand. Well, now you can do that with your Kindle. You can do that with your Sony reader. Um, and depending on the, which particular reader you have, you can download the book instantly at the beach. So you're sitting at the beach, and you finish one and you want to go on to the next one, maybe by that particular uh, author, you can download it right there and you'll have it. It um, doesn't work for all versions, but of course that's where the technology is taking us. If we think about that, how are libraries going to survive? Their journals are online, magazines are online, newspapers are online, books are going to be online, movies are online, uh, music is online, Again, it has to do with service, it has to do with aggregation, it has to do with putting material that's for cost, i.e. subscription, out there for our users. So public libraries, just as they've been doing with audiobooks, just as they've been doing with music collections, and even with some movie collections, should be able to, assuming that the uh, commercial sector allows it, to be able to offer materials for their users to be downloaded from a website or the OPAC or whatever the local node will be for a given uh, public library system or consortia. Similarly with, the elect, uh, similarly, with the academic realm, we'll be seeing aggregation of all these materials together. We'll have our indexes and abstracts linked tightly with our e-journals, linked tightly with our e-books. Citations from the books will go to the journals. Citations from the journals will go to the books. So there will be seamless linking across these. And I put seamless in quotations here because we all know that this is not an easy process. But these are things that the library can be developing. So we'll be providing them with the e-books, of course, and we'll be providing them with uh, music, we'll be providing them with video. Um, all of these things integrated together. Ideally, we've created an OPAC that sort of keeps us or puts all of this material together, I would anticipate that many libraries, particularly academic libraries, will be integrating their OPACs, much that public libraries have done this. So public library consortiums are pretty common. They're the norm these days. A single OPAC servicing 10, 20, or more communities together and making those libraries almost completely virtual as one library. We'll probably be seeing more of that in the academic realm. We do see it in a variety of public academic higher institutions, and I think that more of the public-private, particularly in universities, 
uh, cooperation will also continue in this area. Our users are looking for this type of integration. They're looking for this easy access of materials. I also want to talk about open access. I want to talk about issues related to preprints. I want to talk about issues related to institutional repositories. I also want to talk about databases and other types of non-traditional information resources that libraries in the past have not been using effectively or have not been supporting traditionally. The open access movement has been around for a good decade. Uh, most people are familiar with it. The concept here is that if particular amounts of research have been supported by a public or possibly from a foundation, that once the material reaches print format in the peer-reviewed article, it should be made available to anyone who wants it, free of charge. Um, obviously, there are costs involved in the peer review process, um, but a lot of these costs can be picked up either by the author who's submitting it, by the funding agency, or even by the university via the library or not via the library, as long as the material is made free and accessible to all. Philosophically, a lot of people see this as sort of a right of citizenry, particularly if they are paying for the materials. Also, philosophically, people see this as a way to help developing countries. Uh, many of the countries that are connected to the Internet, that are developing their educational systems, uh, appreciate having online resources, and the more that they can access uh, via the Internet for free, the easier it will be for them to sort of reach up and to continue to grow and to reach the same level that many Western universities have. Um, but the open access movement has some issues, of course, one of them is the cost models. Um, whether we go with the green road, whether we go with the gold road, the green road, of course, is self-archiving. Uh, a particular faculty member or researcher has their article and they can put it up on an institutional repository or subject repository. The best known one of these is the physics preprint archive, uh, which is now based in Cornell University at the library system there. Um, but they can also do the Gold Road, which is uh, open access publishing itself. Good examples of this are the Public Library of Science and uh, Biomed Central. Almost lost it there. I've worked with that closely over the years. Um, and there are others as well. But the, the concept here is that there is a model of going through peer review and of creating journals and the packaging of materials that, while free to everyone, still hinges on a lot of the traditional aspects of the peer review process, editorial process, as well as the structure and foundation of individual journals. Publicity has been high uh, ever since Harvard University announced that they would make their faculty, i.e. require their faculty. Of course, there's an option out clause. Um, to post their articles on an institutional repository site. This has been followed up by other universities, including MIT and uh, many others, uh, Princeton, etc. Here we have this concept of a mandate. One of the problems we've had over the years with the green road of open access, with the uh, creating of institutional repositories, has been the fact that if it was open in the sense of voluntary, um, People didn't deposit. We had small, say, 5, 10, 15 percent, some as high as 30 percent in terms of acceptance and, and de uh, depositing their materials. With a mandate, we're hoping that we can get higher. 70, 80, even 90 percent of materials can be deposited into an institutional repository. Libraries, of course, are poised to handle this type of explosion. They have the techniques, they have the knowledge, they have the skills and the ability to create and support institutional repositories. They have been integrated and uh, leading in terms of the development of standards in this area. And I think it's important to say that we will continue to do this and using, for instance, the protogolf for metadata harvesting, connecting our institutional repositories together. But I want the libraries, and I think they are doing this because a lot of them have taken on this new role, to look beyond the traditional sort of article aspect of an institutional repository. We see many good examples of looking at other types of digital objects, learning objects, for instance. There's some really interesting research and exploratory and new types of repositories that will handle things like PowerPoint presentations 
that will handle handouts, that will handle class notes, that will handle video and audio support for classes, and also things like tests and uh, answers to those tests, the keys. All of this linked together via course information, possibly reserved reading material, and all of these objects can be stored. Um, MIT, of course, is one of the best examples of this, um, but many other universities are doing it as well. Linking that to the primary source material, our e-books, our e-journals, etc., is also being developed. I think this is one area where libraries will continue to excel in. Also looking at materials that are related to databases. In the sciences particularly, we're seeing sort of petabyte after petabyte of new material being deposited into a variety of databases. This could be genomic, proteomic, systematic, if we're looking at life sciences. There's a ver wide variety of chemistry-related and other types of databases. Astronomy databases are huge. Physics databases are growing. There's a large uh, collection of new databases in the earth sciences and planetary sciences and climatology and paleo-oceanography, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the National Science Foundation had a report that came out a couple of years ago showing that um, there was danger in many of these databases losing funding, losing support. Libraries, of course, have begun to step forward to handle this, and I think this is a growing area for libraries in the future. Taking this primary source material, taking this uh, supplementing material uh, for research articles, for their books, integrating this all together, providing the search interfaces for them and integrating it again with the other materials, with our traditional articles, with our traditional books, with our traditional videos, etc. So we would have the e-versions of everything that had been in libraries before. We'll be adding things like uh, teaching materials, uh, digital objects that support the learning process. We'll be adding databases and other primary source materials and linking this all together seamlessly, or trying to link it all together seamlessly. This is a large challenge, and it's one in which academic libraries are particularly well poised to handle. Another issue that libraries are going to be dealing with that comes from technology are print-on-demand. The Google Books project, which is reaching nearly 10 million volumes, um, has shown that um, there is an interest, uh, there is demand for older material, sort of the long tail concept that has been discussed so often in the last few years. It's not high interest, but it is growing interest. Um, people are looking to be able to do print-on-demand. Uh, in fact, there's a company that's now out there doing print-on-demand, working with Google Books. Uh, they have a $100,000 machine that they can install in a variety of places. Uh, libraries have begun purchasing this. Bookstores have begun purchasing these machines. They will allow a patron to come in, a client to come in, a customer to come in, and actually say, I want this particular book. I saw it on Google. Could you print it out for me? And the whole book will be printed out. Um, so in this case, print is not dead. We see, of course, when people are doing e-journal reading, they actually download the article itself, and then they print it out and read it. So there's still a demand for print. It's just that they don't necessarily need the print in the library itself. People want access to material and they want to be able to easily read it and maybe they'll be reading it through ebook readers or other types of readers, but in addition they'll be wanting print. And so libraries can be looking at this new technology, this new idea of taking print on demand and helping to develop and support their collections by having this type of service in their libraries. Um, it's not cheap and that's one of the issues that one has to take when examining this particular type of service. But if we ba balance that with the fact that it's a new technology, and like most technologies, the price will drop over time, it will probably become a pretty standard technology in the near future. Another area where technology will have influence in libraries is the actual space in a library. Um, well known, of course, is that libraries are added Wi-Fi. Almost every library in the United States that's a public library has internet access. It's like 99.9 percent, so not quite that high, but it's very close to that. Um, we offer wireless services in most of our libraries, particularly academic libraries, and we're offering a variety of different platforms. While the Mac is still not the dominant platform in terms of operating systems, it has grown substantially in the past few years. More and more libraries are offering Mac operating system interfaces. And advantage, of course, with the Mac too is that it can run the um, PC Windows-based systems. 
not many libraries are working with Linux, at least in terms of the general public, because that is an operating system that uh, most users are not familiar with, except for maybe some science technology type people. Um, but then one asks the question, well, how much technology do we need in a given library? Um, that really depends on a user needs analysis of your particular population, whether it's an academic library setting, sort of a, if we're looking at the university research level versus, say, the community college level, and, of course, whether we're talking about public libraries. Now, the variety of fact, a variety of factors um, feed into the support mechanism here. You can do an analysis to find out what people are using. We see trends, for instance, of accessing the Internet more by mobile technologies. So when we look at creating our new OPACs, when we look at creating and aggregating new e-resources and creating search interfaces and linking to other materials, we want to make sure that we keep our eye on this particular trend of mobile use of the Internet. Um, if anyone has looked at, for instance, you know, their iPhone and go to the Internet um, or a Palm or one of the others, you'll notice that some websites look great and others look terrible. The design factor is a key component here. Um, and so when we're designing, we want to make sure that we're designing for mobile applications as well as for non-mobile applications. I want to talk about technical services, cataloging and metadata for just a few minutes. One of the trends that we're seeing in terms of accessing information is that the average user is not looking for sophistication in terms of metadata, in terms of cataloging. Keyword searching is pretty much good enough for them. Um, that, of course, bothers a lot of librarians because we've been trained and we have these uh, talents and skill sets that allow us to actually catalog anything in detail, in many cases more detail than is necessary. Um, I know a lot of my colleagues are not overly happy with that, but I do think that the MARC format itself is really something that needs to be dropped. Something more along the idea of Dublin Core or some of the other newer ones that are coming out is simply a better idea in terms of most materials that we're putting. Um, minimal cataloging and OPACs, if we look at the analysis of how people are using our OPACs, subject ser searching, even if it's enhanced or even if we're using folksonomies or even if we're using user tagging, still is not a very popular way of searching. Keywords for authors and titles, maybe yes, we do see a strong sort of focus on those. But just general searching of words, regardless of what the type of information is, and regardless of the type of format the information is, is the way that most users are going. Yes, this goes against a lot of the information literacy programs that we've put out there. And I am sort of of the mindset that we should be designing systems that make it easier for our users, regardless of what their knowledge level is in terms of how information is structured, versus those that say we should be spending much more time developing systems that are more complex and more advanced. Um, but at the same time, the yeah, end that doesn't sound good. I'm going to be shot for that one if I say that one. Two approaches to this process are one, that we design the systems that make it easier for our users, or that we design advanced systems that we can then make simpler and through some teaching like information literacy um, will allow a user to access the information in an easier way. I also want to talk a little bit about metadata and how information technology and our clients, our patrons, and the way that they are using information affects metadata and cataloging itself. In general, most of our users are happy with the way we've done things, at least in terms of generalized information in the past. Most users are generalists in that they don't need really specific types of metadata to help them, help them fulfill their information need. Um, a good 60 to 70 percent of people are happy with just keyword searching. They don't need detailed descriptor searching, they don't need detailed title, they don't need detailed author or any other types of information that might be available through a mock record, Dublin Core, etc. However, we do have a small percentage of our population in the public and more especially in academia that are experienced, that do want in-depth searching, that do want to be able to limit in a variety of different ways. And so it's important that we do have some fairly detailed metadata available for a lot of our resources. Of course, much of this is supplied by the aggregators, by the vendors, by the publishers themselves. But much of the material is created by ourselves, particularly when we're developing our own digital libraries. 
how far do we catalog? What areas do we need to do or provide metadata for? Research shows that many users are interested, of course, in title and author, which are the two most frequently used ones after keywords. However, more specific information, of course, like year, publisher, um, if it's an article, where did it come from, the creator, et cetera, is important in this process. But I don't think we need to get down to the level that we see in the MARC format. I feel, and much of the research shows, that a lot of the detail that is captured in the MARC record is not used by anyone other than maybe some librarians. So there's a balance that needs to be built here in terms of how much human resources we put into this particular process of metadata creation and cataloging versus the generalized needs of most of our users. Keeping in mind again that we do have this specialization even if it's a small percentage of our users which of course includes us. So there's a need to support both of these and we need a good balance in this particular area. Technology will help in that because a lot of metadata can be generated automatically these days and there are more and more software programs and other types of approaches to de developing automatic metadata then as an expert, librarians will be able to go in and add value to that particular set of metadata so that our advanced users can get to the material that they want. Um, we can see examples of this in a variety of the online resources, things like um, Science Direct, for instance, from Elsevier uses some of the automatic approaches with added information. Uh, PubMed does a lot of automatic generation. A lot of institutional repositories are doing this as well. So this is an area where the technology is beginning to so is beginning to reach the point where we can get the basic metadata that we want without actually having to have anyone tag it in or type it in, and that we can add when necessary the added value component to that. So there, that will fix that one that I just had a few minutes ago. My guess is we're at 44 or something like that. We're at 51. 51 minus now 10 minutes of stuff. <coughs> okay. There was a question that I wanted to get to, and I think I'll just enter it in one second. Yeah. I want to finish with a few other thoughts. The first has to do with cost. We all know that e-resources are very expensive, whether they're in the public library realm or whether we're talking about academic libraries, and most especially if we're talking about science materials. Um, the e-book and e-journal packages are not cheap. Um, the supporting technologies, <coughs> excuse me, are not cheap. How do we make sure that we're getting a valuable return on investment for these materials? Statistics, of course, is one area that many of us are using heavily. Information technology and um, other types of information science will be helping us in the near future in developing these. There's the Sushi system that's being developed to help with the new version of Counter, which will allow us to integrate a lot of the usage reports that we're getting from a variety of aggregators. I think it will be important also to be able to look at the individual uh, sort of content level, and technology will help us in this. So when we're looking at an e-journal, it's not necessarily just the title or the year in terms of the people's usage. We want to know what articles they're using. When they're looking at ebooks, we want to know what chapters they're downloading. This will allow us to, to better serve our patrons, to get a better idea of the return on investment for each of the items. Are we looking at older materials, for instance, in a particular area? Are people using just the newer materials? Do we need back files that will help us answer these particular questions? When it comes time for ebooks, what type of topics, what type of electronic books are people using? In the public library, we can pretty much assume that a lot of it will be um, <clears throat> the fiction materials, but there will probably be a large interest for nonfiction materials, travel guides, repair manuals, that sort of thing. How do we know this? We'll have to be able to look at the statistics. A lot of statistics work in the past has been fairly primitive, and it has taken a lot of time to put statistics information together to get, for instance, uh, cost per use, for instance, of a download article, or the cost per abstract, or the cost per search on an indexing and abstracting service. Um, how to integrate this and how to determine what the per unit cost is. Do we look at an article as the per unit? Do we develop a model using statistics that will help us to say a return on investment is 
that this particular article from this particular vendor or this particular aggregator might cost, say, $4 to support. That will include the technology. That will include the actual purchase of the resources themselves. That will include maybe human resource support in the process, as well as all the IT support that will go along with it. Or is it a chapter in a book that we look at for this particular model? It's important for us to be thinking of disaggregating information. How much will it cost to support this particular video in the system? Or how about this particular learning object that we have in our institutional repository? Technology and the, work, and the development of technology these days and the advancement of statistics and analysis uh, tools is increasing, but yet it hasn't quite reached the point where we can easily gather this type of information and do this type of analysis. So we'll be looking a lot for meaningful statistics, statistics that don't take up most of our jobs each and every day. Uh, and to develop cost models to give us an idea of what type of technologies do we actually need in the library at any given time. A lot of us, for instance, never bothered to look at it and analyze, analyze um, indexing and abstracting services. Only recently have we been looking at those. We have been, of course, looking at, for instance, e-journal articles and the cost per down download use. But how is that integrated? Are people going from an indexing and abstracting service, or are they going directly to the article themselves? Are they going through Google and then coming into the article? So there's a variety of issues that we need to be looking at in terms of support mechanisms and developing these types of models. The final thing I'd want to talk about is um, how we actually continue learning. That's one of the issues here that most librarians are facing, is that with the development of new technology, we sometimes feel that we're falling behind. I don't think this is always the case. There are many librarians out there, and there are many institutions, library institutions, that are developing a lot of these new technologies. And I think it's imperative for us to continue to work forward, knowing that the library is not going to disappear. It's just going to transform. How it transforms depends on how we react to the technologies. We can, of course, help in development, which is what we've been doing as a profession for many, many years. And in many cases, it's leading. If we look back historically at online catalogs, for instance, we've been leading in database uh, design. We've been leading many different, in many different areas. So here is the opportunity to be thinking of how we're going to handle that and how are we going to get into leader, leadership positions. And a lot of that will have to do with our new skill sets and how we change in our libraries and how we adapt to that particular of this particular new realm. Just as an ending, I invite people to comment. I invite people to contact me. This, of course, has just been sort of an, a videotape with material to support it, um, not live. I prefer actually inter interacting with people. So on this particular presentation, you'll find my email, leech at simmons.edu. Feel free to contact me that way. I'll be happy to chat with you on Facebook. I'll be happy to chat with you if you want to send Twitters back and forth, if you want to text message me, uh, and many other different ways. Uh, feel free to contact me, and let's see how we can make this future our future. Let's see how we can lead. Let's see how we can continue leading in this process. And thank you for your time. Hope you enjoyed it. Bye.